Testing. Testing. Uh, if we could come uh, introduce ourselves, that would be great. Leslie Hervey, clerk to the board. County Commissioner Alicia Reese. Good afternoon. I'm County Commissioner Denise Driehaus. Jeff Aluto, County Administrator. County Ass Prosecutor's Office. Thank you all so much. I'm Stephanie Summerall Dumas, President of the Hamilton County Board of Commissioners. We will move forward as we always do. Uh, with our order of business, silent prayer, and Pledge of Allegiance. I would ask to, after we have our silent prayer, if you could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Also, uh, in your prayer, if you'd like, if you would think about uh, Roe v. Wade and the position that people are in to make decisions and that calm minds uh, come out of all this discussion and uh, that we think about the people that are involved in that process. So if you would also think about that, I certainly would appreciate it. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the previous session. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Dreamhouse? Yes. Thank you so much. We will get to work. Um, the first order of business are presentations. And this May is Building Safety Month. And I do have a proclamation to proclaim Building Safety Month. Um, you guys can come up front while, while I'm reading. I'm not going to read it all, um, but all of it is important. So whereas our county is committed to recognizing that our growth and strength depends on the safety and a central role of our homes, buildings, and infrastructure, both in everyday life and when the disasters strike, and whereas our confidence in the resilience of these buildings that make up our community is archived through the devotion of vigilant guardians building safety and fire prevention officials, architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, design professionals, laborers, 
plumbers, and others in the construction industry who work year round to ensure the safe construction of buildings. And whereas those modern building codes include safeguards to protect the public from hazards, such as hurricanes, snowstorms, tornadoes, wild land fires, floods, and earthquakes. And whereas safety for all building codes in action, the theme for Building Safety Month 2022 encourages us all to raise awareness about planning for safe and sustainable construction, career opportunities in building safety, understanding disaster mitigation and energy conservation, and creating a safe and abundant water supply for all of our benefit. So I'll move down and say, whereas each year in observance of Building Safety Month, people all over the world are asked to consider the commitment to improve building safety, resilience and economic investment at home and in the community, and to acknowledge the essential service provided to all of us by local and state building departments, fire prevention bureaus, and federal agencies in protecting lives and property. Therefore, now be it proclaimed, that the Hamilton County Board of Commissioners encourage our citizens of Hamilton County, Ohio to join with their communities in participation in Building Safety Month activities. Be it further proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Hamilton County, Ohio does hereby proclaim May 2022 as Building Safety Month. And this is signed by all of the commissioners. Congratulations. Words. Commissioners, thank you very much uh, for uh, proclaiming May as Building Safety Month. This is the 43rd year uh, that uh, there has been a Building Safety Month. Can we hear? Yeah, lift it up there or just speak out just a okay. little bit. Having... All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, Building Safety Month is uh, sponsored by uh, ICC. They, uh, we are a member of ICC. It's the International Code Council. They develop all the codes internationally, or they develop codes for uh, internationally for all building codes to be based upon. The Ohio State Code is based upon that for building codes, and we use the Ohio State building codes. Uh, so that's building, plumbing, mechanical, electrical. All those codes are, are based upon the international uh, the international uh, codes, um, the building codes, that is. And uh, from there, they're very important uh, to establish those codes so that uh, we have safe buildings and structures here. And whenever we build those, our, our inspectors here inspect them. We do plan reviews. All those inspectors and plan reviewers are certified um, to inspect those. So it's important that we have codes developed so that we can have safe structures. Safety is our utmost concern. When we go through and do plan reviews and inspections, we want to make sure the all buildings are sound. We do 14,000 building inspections per year. We do 5,500 building permit applications. We process those per year. We do a lot you know, from there within our building inspections area. So it's very important to us uh, building safety. This summer is a time when a lot of people get out there and do work on them on their uh, properties, especially residentially. They build their decks. They may want to finish their um, basements, or they may want to build an above ground pool. All those require a permit. We want them to be safe, and we encourage everybody to get go out and get a building permit and make sure that we can help them be safe. So um, as a part of Building Safety Month, we have four weeks uh, that uh, we have a different theme each week. Just want to go over each one of those, those themes. One is uh, planning for a safe and sustainable tomorrow. Obviously, sustainability within our building codes is very important. Uh, so that to make sure that uh, uh, houses are uh, the most uh, efficient that they can be, so that uh, we're not cranking through gas and electric and our resources. That's a very important part. That's this week. Second week is exploring careers and building safety. We are a big shortage of building inspectors and plan reviewers. We are constantly looking. We have open positions currently that we need to fill. It's a very difficult position to fill, but it's an important one, obviously, for building safety. The third week is understanding the four phases of emergency management. Obviously, we have tornadoes and floods here. We, as building inspectors, are responsible to make sure that we are out there when these happen. 
when flood happens, we make sure uh, that our teams go out and help uh, fire departments and EMA. We also go out in tornadoes. We're the ones who go out and inspect those facilities. So it's very important, obviously, working with Nick Crosley and his staff. The, third, the fourth week is about creating a safe and abundant water supply. And obviously, we plumbing codes are a part of building safety and the, the codes that we pass. So from that point, having safe you know, water for those to drink is very important for us as well. That's the fourth week. And uh, from there, um, I'm not gonna say too much more about that. Um, we have some great, uh, other, another proclamation here and some business for you to attend. I would like to introduce Mike Stalin. He's your building official and uh, he doesn't get much opportunity to be in front of you. So I thought uh, he'd have an opportunity to speak. And, and from that point, I don't wanna hog his limelight. So thank you very much for approving uh, the, uh, for passing the proclamation today. And uh, again, wish everybody out there a safe summer and make sure they get in for the building codes. Thank you so much. Hang around. We'll do a picture in a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself because I've been in this position about a year, but because of COVID and stuff, I've never had an opportunity to be in front of the commission. Um, obviously, we work year round educating our staff on the codes. The codes are constantly changing. Building technologies are always changing. We work with the fire departments, the health departments. Um, but the, in this month, we're just paying we're paying special attention on educating the public. So we appreciate your support. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll open it up for my colleagues for any comments that they may have. Welcome, um, Vice President Reese. Thank you. The only thing I would say, the you hit, hit some points about uh, families and the, the deck work and improvements to homes that are happening. So um, I just think that's important. You have a whole week of activities and Hopefully it's on, on our website that people can um, get the information of the different weeks. So thank you. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you, thank you all for being in here. I'm always happy to recognize Building Safety Month. Um, and just a, a big thank you to the work that you do trying to make sure that we all remain safe, whether we're in this building or any other building in the county, um, you and your team are doing that work for all the rest of us. So uh, thank you to you and I hope you pass along our thanks to your team as well. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, yes. Um, uh, on the heels of Commissioner Driehaus's comment, I just want to thank James and Mike. They do a fantastic job up in the planning and development office. And as, as you said, Commissioner, their entire team, this is a, a department that um, routinely is put on the front lines of having to balance serving as the front door for economic development in this community. When someone needs a permit, whether it's commercial, residential, they're coming in to see these guys. Um, and so they have to put on that customer friendly face and they have to have customer friendly processes yet at the same time serve as the regulator that says, here's how you have to do things correctly. And that's a really difficult role. And these guys have established a really strong legacy uh, in balancing that customer service and public safety uh, to the degree that uh, you know, we don't get a lot of calls anymore about uh, process, process problems or anything like that. Uh, they do a great job balancing customer service and making sure that we stay safe. So I just wanted to thank them for that. Thank you. Um, and you have openings. You have lots of job openings, so we need to. First, you don't have to go need, through them, but I wanted people to know. Building that inspectors. Watching. Yeah, we Sir, have quite with experience. Yeah. Yes. What did you say? We need building inspectors with experience. Okay. Do you need any other ones that don't have to have a lot of experience? No, we in need other people areas? with experience. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying, are there any, like someone can come in at a, a certain level and then learn and grow they'd have to that. have construction experience okay okay yes. within That's the department that we, we make i know that we have a lot of baked experience uh or other positions that are available um they are on your website mm -hmm. uh, from there on the human resources site so from the other positions are available uh, within the department. They may not be building inspectors, which require some background in, uh, in the construction field, um, but uh, we are more than happy to uh, fill those positions with uh, able-bodied uh, folks that can uh, fill those positions. So we're, we're really looking to get those filled. So yes, uh, they may need some experience in the building side. We have plans examiners who have to be architects or engineers, but uh, again, uh, please check out the website. And from that standpoint, we would love to see some applications on those. Okay, thank you so much. We'll come down and take a picture with you. Yeah. Mike, you're in. Yeah.
then uh, yeah, and then here's the commissioners. And if you guys come over here a little bit, that's so many of them. And that highlight will look at that camera here. Where am I? And then uh, if you guys want the commissioners in. I yeah, why don't we just do what we don't want to do? I just want to come on here. Yeah. Okay. That works for us. That's easier. Thank you. Two, three. One, two, three. Good. Thank you. Thank you. One, two, three. Three. <laughs> One more. Okay, we have one more proclamation recognizing National Children's Mental Health Awareness Week in Hamilton County. And I will read that proclamation. Uh, mental uh, health is my uh, expertise. I have been a social worker for 40 plus years, so, uh, but it never changes. There's always issues as it relates to, to mental health and especially with children uh, that we need to tackle. Uh, really, the problems don't change, uh, but we need to con our intervention and strategies that we use may be somewhat different. And we have some people here to speak about it, I, I believe. So, whereas addressing the complex mental health needs of children, youth, and families today is fundamental to the future of Hamilton County, and whereas the need for comprehensive, coordinated mental health services and education for children, teens, and adults and families places upon our community a critical responsibility. And whereas National Children's Mental Health Awareness Week is an annual event sponsored by National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. And whereas this week will be celebrated in over 1,100 communities all across America to raise awareness of programs for the mental health needs of youth and young adults, to promote positive youth development, recovery, and resilience, and to show how youth, teens, and adults can thrive in the community. And whereas journey, to successful living and one in five are partnering this year to raise awareness of the mental health needs of children, teens and adults. And whereas Journey to Successful Living, a program of the Hamlin County Mental Health and Recovery Services Board is effectively caring for the mental health needs of transition age youth, young adults 14 to 21 and their families in our community. And whereas One in Five is a nonprofit organization that serves to increase awareness and education to prevent suicide by erasing the stigma of mental illness and promoting optimal mental wellness for teens and adults. And whereas Journey to Successful Living partners with Hamilton County Job and Family Services, Hamilton County Juvenile Court, Hamilton County DDD Services, Cincinnati Public Schools, provider agencies, families, and youth to coordinate services and supports. Along with One in Five and their partners, urge citizens, agencies, and organizations to participate in raising awareness about mental health. And therefore, be it proclaimed that the Hamilton County Board of Commissioners encourages Hamilton County residents to participate in National Children's Mental Health Awareness Week on May the 1st through the 7th 2022 to help bring attention to the well being and mental health of the children, teens, and adults in our county. Be it further proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Hamden County, Ohio, does hereby proclaim May 1st through the 7th, 2022, as National Children's Mental Health Awareness Week. And it's signed by all of the commissioners. We have our speaker here, uh, Linda. Yes, Linda Gallagher, yes. Vice President with Mental Health and Recovery Services Board. 
Thank you. Commissioners really appreciate your recognition of children's mental health awareness. Um, as you know, it has been a really hard year. Uh, not, not just one year, it's been a really hard two years. These last two years with the pandemic, with isolation, uh, with, with um, just families struggling with the many, many struggles that they've gone through over these past years, it really has hit families and youth with behavioral health issues, especially hard. And so we're thrilled to be able to bring awareness to children's mental health, aware, children's mental health, um, the need for services in our community. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to fund at the Hamilton County Mental Health and Recovery Services Board since 2009 has been the Journey to Successful Living program. And what that does is it provides opportunities for youth with behavioral health issues to get the services that they need. They have access to treatment. They have access to housing. A lot of these you know, services are really designed to try and help these young people transition into adulthood. Uh, they, they need services and supports throughout uh, much of their life and, and being able to provide those services and supports from the youth system to the adult system the Journey to Successful Living program does exactly that. We have um, multiple partners, as you read in your proclamation, who participate in this project. Uh, we have Journey staff with us here today. We have Evelyn Sears, who works with me at the board. Uh, we have Kenya Wilson, who works at JFS. We have Katie Yeager, who works at New Path. And, and they're working with us, with these youth and families every day. We are also proud to announce our partnership with One in Five this year. The suicide, the climbing suicide rate among our youth in Hamilton County is alarming. And um, Nancy is going to talk a little bit more about One in Five. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you so much. Nancy Miller. Yeah. Hi, commissioners. Thank you for the proclamation today about children's mental health. As Linda said, um, the need for this um, service has escalated um, dramatically over the last two years um, after coming um, from a, a place of already very high need. Um, with one in five, we really are in that prevention space, um, and we really believe very strongly that we need to get ahead of this problem. We need to educate people about what they're looking for, um, what the services are, how to have that conversation. Um, one in five works with about 100 schools and the six universities in Cincinnati doing that work. Um, we have seen great success doing that. Um, we talk about all the time, it's about normalizing that conversation. It's so critical at this time. And as Linda said, what we've seen over the last probably six months, that that suicide rate in our youth has, um, it's, it's extremely high right now. Um, we know that this isolation in the last two years have really taken a toll on families and youth. Um, so I really, I, I um, really appreciate the fact that you're recognizing that today um, and you're making that a priority. So thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll have uh, my colleagues, if they have any comments or questions, and, and you're absolutely right, the suicide element, we don't want to talk about it. We want to keep it in the dark. And we can't do that if we're going to solve it. That's for sure. So um, I just want to say very briefly, we have a youth with us here today who is part of our journey program. Would you want to come up and introduce yourself? If that's okay. Sure, that's fine. Thank yeah, you. That's great. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. My name is Amaya. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us anything that we need to know about the program that's going on? Mm -hmm. Basically, what I do is I get counseling. So I meet with my worker every week or every two weeks. And we, she basically just helped me with like resources, like talking to me, talking, I mean, talking to me about like jobs and like therapy and things that can like help me with my mental health mm -hmm. and just leading me to like the next steps. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. That's awesome. And the, and the fact that you came down to, to speak to us and put a face to what we're celebrating. So thank you so very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Any comments? I just wanted to uh, 
uh, to say it. Basically, she said it all. Um, I just wanted, want you to know that, um, that our board um, certainly takes this very serious. We've put uh, some of the uh, American uh, rescue dollars, ARPA money, uh, toward mental health. We're looking at what would be uh, some of our final investments. And one of the things that we recognize then and also now is the issue of trying to reduce uh, teen suicide. Uh, so just want to let you know that uh, not only are we presenting a proclamation, but we're also putting dollars and looking at innovative ways to help provide additional services based on based on the need. So just wanted to say that. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you all for being here. <clears throat> Our pleasure to recognize such an important month or important week uh, related to mental health. Um, I, I, I agree that you know this is a situation that within the last couple of years has gotten far more difficult, for, especially for young people in this community. And we're hearing it from the boys and girls that we inter interface with, whether they're in school or um, outside the classroom. Uh, we know that kids are really struggling related to isolation and some of the challenges because of COVID. So thank you for reminding us, bringing it to our attention again. Um, we have created uh, different buckets related to the American Rescue Plan, and mental health is one of those buckets, which I think does... Uh, exemplify how important we think this issue is related to what we hear in the community. The one other thing I want to say is thank you for helping remove stigma that still exists related to mental health so that young people and adults feel that comfortable um, seeking the support that they need because they need the support. And, uh, and sometimes I think we get hung up on what it means to need support. And, and you guys are helping and you are all helping break down that stigma. So thank you for doing that work every day in the community. And also thank you for the ribbons. They're very nice we're wearing from you guys. So thank you. We'll come forward and take a picture with you. Uh, we'll go close. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you. All righty. So next are public comments. We have quite a few today, which is great. Um, Gary Davis for ARP funding. And you have two minutes. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. um, hello, everybody. My name is Gary Davis. I am the owner of Water Lily Learning Centers. We have a center downtown and a center in Eastgate. Um, I am coming before you today to ask that in your decision of the allocation of the funds that are available, that you consider the importance of early childhood education. Um, I mean, it was just during COVID that we were considered essential workers. And finally, being deemed essential workers because we provide the necessary care needed for parents to go to work. So... I am asking, I'm coming here to let you know today that centers are still struggling, small, medium, large centers and home providers. And funding is definitely needed in order for us to stay in business so that we can continue to provide services for families and children. Um, let me see. Okay, yes, and I, I just want you to continue to continue to provide us the support that we need with the funding and the monies that are available and consider the importance of early childhood education and the fact that we do provide the services, quality services for families in order for them to work. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And can you repeat what the name of your center is? It's Water Lily. Water Lily. Learning okay. Centers. Okay. Yep. L I L Y. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh huh. Let's see. Um, Jeff. Oh, hi. How are you, Miles? Uh huh. Hello, board. Hello. Thanks so much. My name is Jeff Mills. I'm the township administrator for Coleraine Township, and I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to say thanks. Um, Coleraine Township has been very focused this year and last on making our community clean, green, prosperous, and safe. We have a strategic plan to, to get us there, but we can't do it alone. And we've had an incredible partnership with Resource, uh, a Hamilton County Department, formerly known as the uh, Solid Waste District. And I just wanted to take a minute to share with you how appreciative we are for that partnership. Uh, Michelle and her team have become trusted advisors and um, have, have participated in local initiatives like our Team Up to Green Up initiative, which connects uh, businesses through our chamber with uh, programming to uh, eliminate uh, littering and, and um, uh, hopefully raise money for street trees also. Um, She's also been, you know, as, as home to the regional landfill, uh, waste diversion is a very uh, important thing to us. And um, uh, diverting organics is a big focus for resource this year. And we were happy to partner with them and, and uh, think of some innovative solutions to uh, diverting organics in our community. So we appreciate the continued partnership. Thank you. Thank you. You're always welcome. We'll pass it on for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Heidi Thompson. Hello. Um, Hello. I am here to speak on the consideration of the, I guess, the ARPA. Pull your microphone down just a little. Yeah. Is that better? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, I'm with the Center for Addiction Treatment. Um, I'm here to talk about the consideration of, of the distribution of the um, HARPA funds. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wrote this out because I'm not always good at speaking. So um, it says, hi, my name is Heidi Thompson. I'm honored to say that I am the community outreach coordinator at the Center for Addiction Treatment. I am also a wife, a daughter, and a mother to three beautiful, resilient children, one of which is graduating this month and will go on to college on a scholarship offer at Siena Heights in Adrian, Michigan. She will be one of the first girls in history to wrestle on their women's team. I'm a very proud mom. Why do I tell you this? I tell you this because that young lady had to overcome giving her mom CPR on our basement floor while calming her siblings and calling 911. I will tell you that I'm so honored to be a part of CAT, a place that helps save lives and rebuild families because I am a walking testimony of CAT's mission. CAT saved my life. It takes every employee and future employees of CAT to continue making a difference. I'm so grateful the opportunity was available to me when I was ready at that moment. We all know that window of when an individual is ready and may change their mind is crucial to saving a life. I went to do my community outreach that I do every week just to be available to show up as a helping hand and offer services if someone does decide that they want help. Just the other day, a woman cried to me as she told me her son's graduating this year. He wants his mom there, as any child does and as any child deserves, right? This woman meant every single word as she told me wholeheartedly that she would be attending her son's graduation and she would do it sober. You and I know that this woman may not be sober. She may not show up and this mother may not even be alive at that point. Can you, can you summarize it yeah, at the end? Yeah. Um, so I just want Kat to be ready when any mother, father or daughter is ready to reach out for help. I want us to be ready to help them like they helped me. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming forward and your comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nicole Frederick. I also have written something. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nicole Frederick. I am the Access and Outreach Manager at Center for Addiction Treatment. I'm here to request your consideration for allocation of the ARPA funds to support core recovery services. CAT has a special place in my heart because it gave me my father back. He sought help at CAT years ago and now has 12 years sober. The change I witnessed in him attracted me to find recovery for myself. So I know that CAT truly does save lives and rebuilds families. Working at CAT for me is not only an honor, but a passion. I get to meet people in the community where they are at and give them hope and encouragement. By building these relationships and helping to reduce the stigma with these individuals who suffer from substance abuse, 
when they are ready to get treatment, they feel safe to reach out. As we all know, there is a small window of opportunity when someone reaches out for help. It is imperative that we act immediately. Unfortunately, due to staffing shortages, we have had to cap our admissions to only six a day. There have been times when I've had to call, tell clients we don't have any appointments available due to limited staff. Although this can be frustrating from a business perspective, to me and my team, this is a life or death situation. Not having funding to pay staff at a competitive rate puts us in a position that could potentially hurt not only our clients, but our community. When a person finds the courage to reach out, it is my hope that we are here, ready and able to continue to give them the chance at life that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much. And congratulations on getting your father back in your life. Thank you. Shelly McClellan. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, Hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Shelly McClellan. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and the CEO of the Center for Addiction Treatment. Over the past five years, our center has served over 5,250 individuals with substance use disorder through our inpatient outpatient services. At no time during the pandemic did we close our doors. Over 80% of our patients reside in Hamilton County and 98% of them qualify for Medicaid. We play a crucial role in the Hamilton County Addiction uh, Response Coalition's continuum of care. Treatment works. 62% of CATS patients successfully complete their level of care. In fiscal year 2021, CAT served 1,415 unique Hamilton County residents. Quality matters. CAT is Ohio State certified and Joint Commission accredited. CAT adheres to the American Society of Addiction Medicine criteria. Given the cost of living increases, funding for core services is more important than ever. Ensuring SUD, uh, uh, SUD providers have resources to hire and train clinical and medical staff is crucial. CAT has 78 beds available, uh, but most of them in 2021 and first quarter of 2022 have remained open um, because we don't have the staffing to um, accommodate the numbers. Uh, we're 24 seven and we have to have nursing care in a ratio to, to keep people safe. On behalf of our board, I'm here today to express concern um, with the ARPA funding recommendations for the strengthening mental health behavior, strengthening mental, mental health, behavioral health and substance use disorder funds. Uh, most of them are going towards helping to remove stigma and increase um, awareness and access to services. But if the services don't have the staffing we need to deliver and have beds available, then it's for not. Um, we also ask that you give us uh, agencies who are treating folks with um, opioid use disorder um, access to the One Ohio funds as they come available for the for the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob Meekum. Good afternoon, County Commissioners. It's great to be here. My name is Bob Meekum. I retired from Lighthouse Youth Services after 41 years, about four years ago. Uh, shortly after I retired, I was asked by the board of the Crossroads Center to serve as their interim CEO to help manage the program and to help find Jamal Boyd, who is now the CEO of the Crossroads Center. I am now the chair of the board of the Crossroads Center, and I'm here on behalf of the Crossroads Center and in support of First Step Home, Talbert House, and the Center for Addiction Treatment in their efforts to continue to survive as the backbone of our county's addiction treatment services. These Nonprofit agencies are at the very core, the very backbone of the residential treatment, the withdrawal management, the detox services that our citizens suffering from addiction uh, need. It's going to continue to be a very difficult year for them. Uh, the, protect, the payroll protection program helped enormously to keep them going during the pandemic. But as those funds have expired, their needs continue. It's um, 
it's really vital that all of these agencies receive enough financial support to maintain their existing staff. And I know from my experiences with the Center for Addiction Treatment, Talbert House, and the Crossroads Center, that all of these services are at risk if we can't find a way through the American Rescue Program to help sustain them at least for a year to help them to continue to get through this, this crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. If we can, if we can open that door now. It was allowed before, thank you. Uh, Rosemary Babies Company. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so let me get my notes. Um, I would first like to say thank you so much for allowing um, organizations such as um, nonprofits like Rosemary's Babies Companies and others to speak. Um, I can appreciate that it is Mental Health Awareness Month, but it is also Teen Pregnancy Prevention Month. And as the CEO of Rosemary's Babies Company, I come to speak on behalf of uh, teen parents who are oftentimes overlooked in your budgetary concerns um, as they are homeless, as they deal with mental health issues, as they deal with abuse, and they deal with other stigmas in the areas of educational gaps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, last week, I think it was, I attended your Ohio Commission on Women and Girls and commend them for that. Rosemary's Babies Company supported your social mobility committee. I would ask that their recommendations that you all made resolutions for be considered in your um, ARPA funds proposals. Um, they, even though like, for example, um, I think you voted for supportive housing for our homeless young mothers. If you look at your ARPA fund recommendations, if they're put out as grants, it's kind of difficult to find which one of those categories, you know, teen parents will fall under. So again, our, that population is oftentimes overlooked and an organization that is providing premier services, Rosemary's Babies Company, um, doesn't qualify. And therefore we um, kind of struggle to ensure that this population is served while right now more than 3,000 teen parents in your, um, 3, teens in your county are pregnant and almost 30% of those teens are homeless and don't have anywhere to go if they are under the age of 18. So again, I ask you to consider um, your resolutions that you made last week as you review the recommendations that you currently have made to consider special um, interests in teen parents. Thank you so much. Are you, are you a residential program or just provide services? Out oh, I didn't know it was gonna be questions. No, uh, no. so currently Rosemary's Babies Company operates um, in a business capacity, but we are working to acquire a property through the Port Authority and open a housing support resource center on Reading Road. We've been doing that for the last 18 months. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Farmer. Uh, hello, how's everybody doing? Uh, I know that the funds for the ARPA uh, funds are about, y'all make the biggest decision to allocate the funds. I'm actually uh, putting myself on record right now because I'm actually advocating for a crypto blockchain technology task force. So right now I reached out to Tony Dominia, uh, the pretty much I think the administrative assistant to the county treasurer. He's pretty much for the idea to be able to point someone towards that task force. I've really modeled this after after Miami-Dade County. So I had a resolution that I shot out to a couple of commissioners and I can resend that out again when it comes down to being able to start a task force to look into more data information or identity of or strategic economic development planning to be able to utilize uh, this technology and find out the necessary needs of the technology. So the technology itself has been um, literally Literally, uh, what we call the word is unknown to some to, to certain others, but we know that de digital ledger technology is here to stay. We understand how this technology can be be able to be utilized in infrastructure 
when it comes down to data system, especially the public health data system. I've seen that into one of the one of the, one of the initiatives of the grant, and I would like to be able to see if we can put, uh, assemble a task force or create a resolution to assemble a task force to be able to look into depth into this technology to be able to see the use cases for it. Um, right now, I'm meeting with the mayor of uh, Cincinnati on the 23rd. In regards to that, was my first proposal. I have proposed to to the city. I hopefully that we can be able to get more individuals like yourselves to be able to take an initial, an initial approach when it comes down to this technology, which is distributed ledger technology and blockchain technology. Uh, if you can go back, you can look at House Bill 177 that just been passed as a bipartisan bill when it comes down to the government utilization, <clears throat> to the government, so a government entity and utilize, to utilize distributed ledger technology, including blockchain technology. Okay, thank you very much. And along with the resolution, um, Mr. Farmer, you can you can submit a proposal to, to the clerk's office and we can take a look at that. Also. Yes, ma'am. Thank okay. you. Very good. Uh, Megan C Cummings. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Megan Cummings and I'm representing the Greater Cincinnati Foundation and the Women's Fund of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. As many of you know, we work on racial and gender equity in our community, and we have been mobilized throughout the pandemic, closely listening to the experience and needs of those most marginalized in our community. Our teams reviewed the proposed ARPA distribution budget with great interest, and today I'd like to lift up two global recommendations for your consideration that incorporate what we've learned from our research, our conversations with the community, and our expertise in these areas. First, we would like to recommend that centering race and gender is incorporated into all the ARPA fund allocations. Hamilton County has proclaimed racism as a public health crisis, and we also know that women and people of color were hit hardest by the economic ripple effect of the pandemic. The original ARPA intent is to prioritize disproportionately impacted low-income communities and communities of color Incorporating specific intentions into the RFPs and within the program recommendations would be a critical first step. From our experience, if these goals aren't explicitly stated and executed with intentionality, they are often aren't achieved. Our second recommendation is to put a bigger emphasis on childcare. It is a critical infrastructure issue. Access to childcare comes up in nearly every conversation we have with women especially black women in our community. Although we are probably too late in the process to add a childcare specific bucket of funds, um, you could greatly enhance the presence of childcare in the workforce development section. Especially in the second workforce recommendation, um, childcare is not specifically listed as an employment barrier. All the workforce development trainings and marketing campaigns in the world are not gonna move the needle unless people have access to quality, accessible and affordable childcare, especially for single moms. So thank you for your consideration and we commend you on the really thoughtful process used to create this draft. Thank you. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Vanessa Brito. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for giving us this time. Um, I am the CEO of 4C for Children, although I'm not here to speak for 4C for Children. I'm here to represent the child care arena, as you heard recently from some of our other speakers. The child care workforce is the workforce that supports all other industry workforces. Every new teacher that we can bring into child care, because we su suffered massive losses of teachers, on average, brings six to eight parents back to work or helps them stay at work. And one of the things that I hope to provide to you as a service to you in our role as the CCRNR, Child Care Resource and Referral Agency, is to help you navigate that the state funding that has been allocated actually has enormous gaps when it, and doesn't support most of the workforce pipeline efforts that need to happen to refill those teacher positions. To give you a flavor of that, um, we did a survey of child care centers. We've lost well over 300 child care teachers. Uh, that means 230 classrooms have been closed. And I'm talking just in our Hamilton County area. What that means is 2,600 child care seats are just gone. They were here before the pandemic and now they're gone. We have to create a pipeline to bring new people into child care. 
State funding does not provide any support to do that because the state funding is focused on existing programs and their existing staff. It also doesn't pay them for the five to 40 hours, depending upon what their background is, of training they need because they have to be trained before they can enter a classroom and support the children. Um, I've provided, and I, I will leave it here, uh, a deeper guideline to help you navigate what's in the state funding, what's not in the state funding, and what could we do locally, the way Franklin County in particular and some other counties across the state have done to make sure that we replenish our childcare workforce or we won't have workers in manufacturing, IT, and all of those other arenas. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Mary England. Hi, my name is Terry England, and I am here on behalf of those child care workers. 40 years ago, I started my own center. I have since retired, but I'm still speaking out for those workers who are still there. Um, the ARPA funds that are available would really, really help these centers stay on their feet. The providers, the home providers, the child care centers, they need that as well. When I opened my center, I wanted to help fix the problems with child care, including the lack of accessible, high quality care options and the exorbitant cost of tuition. I also wanted to address the outrageously low wages for our caregivers who are predominantly women of color. I have since learned along my way how inaccessible and expensive, expensive it is for a black woman entrepreneurial to access lines of credit and funding. About 61%, according to the Harvest Business Review, 61% of black women self-fund their total startup costs. Large, largely because of the lack of access to capital. I started my entrepreneurial vis, uh, journey as a novice, but I believed that I could be successful in opening a child care center because of at least a decade of teaching in the educational sector. I hold multi multiple degrees, but that does not stop me from struggling. I struggle and with the help of various agencies like 4Cs, and Head Start, Community Action Head Start, I was able to get on my feet and come out of my home and open two centers. So those centers are five-star centers. They are still standing, they are still operating. So I ask that you look at your funds and, and look at how they can help these child care centers and providers continue to succeed as Black women operate them. Thank you so much for your comments and your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Chris Ellison. Hello, Board of County Commissioners. Hello. Uh, my name is Chris Ellison. I'm with the Cable Academy. We are a 24, we are a 12 week, 24 week training program focused on web development, cybersecurity, and tech support. The last 12 months, we've had 140 grads from Hampton County. 80% of those grads come out with industry recognized certifications. 64% 64, 64 of those grads start a career in technology 60 days after graduation. Their average increase in salary is $31,000 per person. We have two obstacles. How do I pay for my tuition? And how do I survive while I'm learning? That's what we need help with. So I'm asking you guys, please consider us for funds. Please help us minimize student debt shrink the tip gap with homegrown talent, and let's diversify Cincinnati's tech ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have great partnerships with Ohio Means Jobs, Hamilton County, Jobs Ohio, as well as uh, Cincinnati Works. Thank you. So have you submitted anything as it relates to? Yeah. Okay, I wanted to yeah. say, yeah, it's yes. good to talk to us. We'll take <laughs> notes, but yeah, Thank okay, you. great. We have someone on Zoom, Megan Mitchell. Hello, Megan. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Wonderful. My name is Megan Mitchell. I am a board member for the Incubator Kitchen Collective. We are based in Newport, Kentucky currently and moving a location to uh, the Tri-County area mm -hmm. in Cincinnati, Ohio. 
We are a nonprofit organization with shared use commercial kitchen space, focusing on food entrepreneurship, uh, the production of food and business development, both with retail, restaurants. Um, we support our members from seed to startup. Our members graduate and start restaurants and create business all over the county. Thank you for the, to the county for your insight in including us in the workforce development uh, or including workforce development as a recommended expenditure for the ARPA funds. We completely agree. As those heavily involved in the hospitality industry, we know that there's a drastic need for more workforce development here. There are culinary, culinary programs, but there are no hospitality training programs. We desperately need this development. As you may have heard, the new IKC will be based in Tri-County Mall site. As a part of our operations there, we are developing a job training program for hospitality workers. We envision the program will recruit adults from the area with a focus on those most in need. We will also work to develop a partnership with Princeton High School, their STEAM location there, for their students to be able to participate. We will offer a stipend and or other supports to our participants and we will partner with an edu educational institution for certification. The students will receive firsthand training at one of the restaurants in the near, in the Tri-County Development Area, as well as to be placed, you know, hopefully uh, in other areas around Cincinnati. We hope to apply for funding if we qualify once the grant application process begins. And again, we thank you for this much needed funding and your recommendations. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. And that will end our uh, comments from the public. Um, I will move forward with our next item of business, comments and motions. I have a few comments. Um, on April the 29th, um, I was able to visit John Lomax for uh, WKRC who had 39 years of service to this community and the commission presented uh, a proclamation uh, from us to, to thank him for all the service that he's given to our community. Um, and on May the 2nd, I attended an EMA meeting, emergency management um, agency meeting, and they are excited about the relocation to Springdale Long. They will be combining with the 911 system center, I should say, and it's very much needed. Uh, their location is very antiquated, but it will also just combine the staff and the resources in one area as I said, in Springdale. And then on May the 3rd, of course, was election day. And Susan Schiller had a dinner that evening. I was unable to make it, but she spent 39 years also with the Beth Beth Bethany House. And I'd like to thank her for all the work that she's done in the community. Um, I will say about election day, we only had a 12% uh, voting output. And I'm just hoping that more people will come out and vote the next time, because if you want to make a difference, your vote does count. Um, on May the 4th, I uh, was involved with a webinar with CORBA, is the Central Ohio River Business Association, and they monitor the freight traffic on the river and some small rail also, and they're looking at different solutions of how to make that travel on the water a little more uh, efficient. Also on that day, I met with Mr. Forte, who will be leading our new small business office, uh, something that the commission uh, decided we needed. We needed a special office for that purpose. Uh, he'll be working with Alloy, which is was formerly HCDC, and he is going to be leading that charge. And also I met with Director Patton of JFS, our new director, on our new first time youth employment program. JFS has had some employment programs, but this is the first time that the county is taking the lead on this youth employment program for ages 14 to 21. It's an all year round um, job program. And we are really excited about the opportunity of our youth being able to work. And we know they're um, working makes a difference to have your own money in your pocket. It, it makes you think about just going to sleep and going to work and doing the, some of the great things that you need to do and you don't have an idle mind, uh, hopefully. So we're just really excited about this opportunity. I, when I met with Director Patton, I was just 
had to curb my enthusiasm because it's so strategically laid out on how we want it to happen. Of course, all of the commissioners will be taking a look at it. It's a draft right now and to see what we need to add or, or take away from that. And uh, lastly, I wanna thank all staff and, and I got some emails and some cards for my birthday, which is tomorrow. And I, I just wanted to thank everybody for that. I also heard uh, President Biden is coming here tomorrow and I'm sure he's coming for my birthday. Um, so I just wanted to publicly thank everybody and also for my staff pulling together treats for everybody. So that will end my report, uh, Vice President Reese. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> couple things. We had uh, the last person that uh, was on our Zoom, I didn't catch the name, but I'll get it later, um, but would ask the administrator, maybe we could reach out to uh, Megan Mitchell. She mentioned a hospitality training and certified program. Um, I know the Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, just uh, have, they have a program similar. I'm not sure if it's the same. I'm not sure what we do with it. I know we help fund the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, and if not, maybe the two of them need to uh, connect. Uh, and I know that she's out in the, maybe the Princeton area. Um, I saw where they had a program at, uh, at my alma mater. I saw on social media at Withrow. So maybe there's something there um, and maybe there is some, uh, some funding over at the Convention and Visitors Bureau that uh, she can also tap into. So I just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, I thought today was a, a, a great day in terms of uh, our board announcing officially our senior citizen, a new program for senior citizens. And uh, this was an example when um, during the process is why we like to have these public hearings and hear from people. And we heard from a lot of citizens, both at the hearing, the budget hearing, the ARPA hearing, as well as uh, out at the 513 relief bus uh, where we've gone to, we went to 28 different zip codes and 79 locations throughout Hamilton County. And one of the things we saw, we helped a lot of people, over 4,000 people were helped uh, with the partnership with our jobs and family <laughs> services. Uh, we also had over 1,500 people get the vaccine. But what we saw when we were there, we saw seniors who had come out, uh, some in wheelchairs, some on walkers, some with canes, and we were unable to help them because of the federal guidelines saying that, you know, they had a social security check that did not stop. So therefore, they were deemed ineligible for help with their gas and electric, with their water bill, uh, with other things. And as we all know, uh, well, the social security check came in, that did not go up, but everything else did. And we're in a time now, people are fighting right now with inflation, uh, getting the bacon and the eggs at, at your grocery stores going up, getting your gas is going up. Uh, everything has gone up except your check. And our seniors, many of whom are in their own homes, but a lot of our programs at the time, you had to be almost destitute before you could qualify. And so um, I do want to thank the administration because uh, we put forward uh, the need to have uh, some dollars put aside uh, through our levy dollars because we were able to use some other of the ARPA dollars to do some of the other activities for seniors. And this gave us, this opened up and freed us up to have uh, over a million dollar fund to help senior citizens. And this is a, a pilot and the reason it's a pilot is because we want to see is, is it more needs for gas and electric or more needs for the water bill or if it's more needs for home improvements, your, your boiler, your, your, your heating and air conditioner, what is that need? So that in our next budget, we can kind of look at that and know what the need is. Uh, but we're uh, happy to launch it, uh, launch it at the right time because Waterworks, uh, the moratorium, that the city of Cincinnati is in control of, we're not in control of it, they have lifted the moratorium now. So Waterworks is out there. Uh, and I, I'm sure talking with them, they don't wanna be out there, but it's their job and the, and, the, and believe me, they out there and things are getting cut off as we speak. So we wanna make sure that we can connect people quickly so that they don't get cut off. 
Um, and so we had uh, Waterworks was here with us today, uh, joining us also Amy Spiller from Duke Energy. Uh, we appreciate her being here saying, hey, we want to work together and get people, uh, get the bill and the money together so we don't have to cut off anybody either. Um, Council on Aging uh, is our administrator of this program, along with a, a, a new partnership with SOACT, um, Sandra Jones Mitchell, who has been in the community for many, many years, was here. Viola Brown, which our board has, uh, we, we always open it up. We want new people to apply for the board and she was one that applied and she's the new person that's uh, on the uh, senior board and she came out to be a part of this. So uh, the phone number is 513-743-9000. 513-743-9000. Now, all I got to say is Council on Aging, pick up that phone because <laughs> I know people are going to be calling like crazy. Uh, and we will be getting a report, or I'll ask this of the administrator. I'd like to get a report for the board. Get, let us get a report on a weekly basis, maybe part of your report, who has been, you know, people have been helped. So we know kind of uh, people's been helped. And if there's uh, hiccups, these are hip hiccups that we can fix quickly. So if that could be added to your report to us, that would be uh, helpful. But I just think it's a fantastic day. Uh, for senior citizens, uh, they've contributed, they've worked hard, uh, they've done their job, and now they should be able to retire with dignity and respect, be able to be in their own home, pay their bills, and enjoy life. So uh, just was excited about that, and all, all of us was here to have that press conference announcement, which I thought was very good news. Uh, the other thing is, um, had a meeting uh, with the mental health uh, levy folks uh, in terms of what those needs are. And obviously the needs are so much greater than what we have available. Uh, we have people who have been clinically diagnosed and that is a great need. And then we got a lot of people that's out here uh, who have not been diagnosed, who COVID hit them and they had never got hit like this, the grief that they're experiencing, uh, where to go next, all of the uh, ills of the world. That's every time we turn on social media, it's somebody died or some bad news or somebody fighting somebody. And it really has honed in on so many people who now are not afraid to talk about mental health. And so as we look at uh, the, not only the levy, but our budget, how do we diversify mental health so that we have something that can help no matter where you are, there's some help for you. So we heard some, um, Intriguing ideas, some other places, uh, I've even researched them, my staff has, um, Quinton Monroe and Edgar Malcolm. There's some other places where you could go right in if you got a moment. And we're gonna look at those and try to bring those things forward. Maybe not with the levy, but just look at all of our dollars of mental health and what is our umbrella in terms of how do we reach everybody? There's also a grassroots group. I think it's called, um, I think it's Women, some kind of women cultivating movement. Uh, I may got their name wrong, but they had a major event at COPA this weekend with young black males. And they had a barber and, um, and a police officer and it was just all black men. And black men don't get together to talk about mental health like this. Uh, we wanna make sure those kind of groups are not left behind. Those grassroots organizations and what they're doing are part of this. Um, also, this weekend was, uh, this month is Minority Health Month. I know we haven't talked a lot about it because we've been dealing, we've been fighting so many things, COVID and uh, affordable housing and so many things, but I don't want to miss it. Minority Health, uh, we know the statistics before there was a coronavirus and a, and a COVID, uh, minorities, African-Americans were dying at uh, quicker rates. We don't live as long. Uh, a lot of hereditary things are happening, high blood pressure, diabetes, you name it, we're leading. We're always leading in the wrong areas. We don't want to lead in that area headed toward death. We want to be leading the area headed toward life. So uh, I want to give a shout out to Closing the Health Gap. Uh, they had their uh, major event that they have every year. Um, they had uh, this year uh, down at uh, Washington uh, Park. And what I really liked this year, uh, they may have had it in the years before, but I think they really promoted it. They had so many free screenings. 
even if you have insurance, it costs a lot to get these screenings. They say, you know, you go to your doctor and say, well, go over here and get your blood work. And that's a bill over there. And that's a copay over there. This was no copay. They were doing kidney screenings, uh, diabetes screenings, prostate screenings. This was all on the spot. Um, and I just thought they had just, they covered the gamut of screenings. So I want to give a shout out to Closing the Health Gap and Renee Mahaffey Harris and her team. Uh, they did a fantastic uh, job. And I think I saw Commissioner Driehaus uh, was there earlier. I think we crisscrossed each other, uh, but they did a great job, I thought, especially with those screenings. So it's still my, oh, well, no, it's not Minority Health Month. Last month was Minority Health Month. So, um, but please still get out and get moving. Um, the other thing, uh, of course, uh, as was mentioned, Susan Schiller, I did get to meet with her and her predecessor, Peg uh, Dickerson, I think it's Deekers. Uh, got a chance to meet Bethany House. Uh, when you look at what's being built over there in Bond Hill, it's coming up, it's, it's moving forward, it's coming along. And Susan uh, has had excellent leadership uh, in this area and certainly wish her well. And I, um, I believe we all had a proclamation that we did sign. Um, also, I wanna mention uh, the Brent Spence Bridge. I got a call from Bridge Forward Cincinnati, a group who's looking at the bridge saying, hey, we got to do the Brent Spence Bridge, but what is the best route? And they've got some other uh, ideas. And so it was interesting hearing um, their ideas. Uh, I've also asked um, the administration to look at, we had a relief a thon when I first came. We did it by Zoom. We helped 700 families, it was televised, it was streamed. It was before we had the 513 relief bus. Um, and certainly with now the water uh, being expedited in terms of cutoffs uh, with the gas and electric, the, the uh, increase in the cost of that, that's hitting people very, very hard. Um, the thought is to have another relief a thon uh, that would be now in person because it's not COVID. We don't have to, well, we have COVID, but you know what I mean? It's not, uh, we've got boosters and everything, but having something that kind of brings people uh, quickly in. Uh, to be able to help and have waterworks right there with the computer. Here's your bill and having jobs and family services right there. And here is, you know, yes, you qualify, your bill's been paid, thank you and goodbye. And then have the same thing with Duke Energy. Duke Energy is there with the thing, here's your bill, and then jobs and family services, yes, you, you, uh, you do qualify. We've sent it over to Duke Energy, you have been paid to try to bring some 911 help to people now who are going to have to face this because there are no longer any uh, moratoriums. Um, there was uh, the testimony about having a technology commission, if you will, or, or group. I think, um, and I asked the administrator when he gives his comments, in our uh, budget, and in our ARPA, I know I had recommended uh, us looking at technology being number one, being a smart county. And I think that was in there, and I don't know if we're moving into that, but I would recommend in that technology, not just broadband, but to look at all, how to, all technology and having the treasure pulled in and others, whoever needs to be, to look at the future as it relates, because that was the goal for it to be futuristic. And so if crypto and uh, blockchain, certainly all of that should be on the table and looked at as we talk about the future of, um, of technology and being on the cutting edge uh, as a county. So I think we have something uh, that we've started because I know we put it in our budget, but hopefully uh, the administrator can uh, further address that uh, the Cat House, I appreciate your testimony. Um, I know firsthand the Cat House used to be located across from my church, New Friendship Baptist Church, and many people would come over uh, to church on Sunday and we saw the turnaround and people getting that second chance. Uh, so we want, I want to thank you for your work. And then last but not least, uh, as we're seeing these things, as Madam President, you mentioned, we're seeing these, all of these issues that's dividing our country, dividing us at a time when so much is hitting us. We don't need division, we need to be pulled together. Uh, 
Roe v. Wade, they told me that was something we read in the book, not something we would have to be dealing with uh, currently. And uh, certainly as we deal with medical and doctors, when it's my body, I want to talk to a doctor. I don't want to talk to any bootleg doctors. And I think people should, uh, there should be, uh, government should not be telling me what to do. Uh, that's between me and my doctor and those people who are trained uh, in the medical field. So I hate to see those things, Roe v. versus Wade, then we got the Voting Rights Act, and then we don't know what else. Uh, it's time to bring us together and not to uh, divide us with all the pressures of the world that's going on right now. So I wanted to say that and happy birthday, uh, Madam President. Enjoy your birthday and dance, dance, dance. Thank you so much. <laughs> and you just had a birthday, what, a week ago? Yeah, but I didn't get to dance. I got a torn meniscus in my knees. I got to hop, hop, hop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of things. I, I too want to thank the folks that came in today. Some are still here and some have left the, the um, room, but thank them for helping inform our decisions related to the ARP funding. Um, I too was out delivering some proclamations uh, in the last week. Um, Eric Beck and I, and Eric is always at these meetings and today he's not. Um, there's nothing on the agenda for the engineer. Eric, I hope you're watching because we tag teamed an event up at the zoo. Uh, the Hamilton County Conservation District had something called Caring for Our Watershed where students came in, um, identified a problem and then solved it. And it was really cool. It's always cool to see young people doing this kind of stuff. Um, but they got $1,000 to help them with their work. They were from all over the county and some outside the county. And so Eric and I got to present these big checks to these kids. And it was it was good fun. And I want to applaud them and their families for the work that they did. Um, and then also Eric held his annual meeting of county and township officials and authorities. And I attended that. It was virtual. A lot of times it's in person, but it was a virtual this time. Uh, and it was very well run and uh, very informational. Um, I was at the Health Gap Expo always. Uh, they had a lot of booths set up this year and it was at Washington Park. It was a, started out as a rainy day, but it got nice. Um, so it was good to see the vendors and the folks that were hanging around at the Expo. Um, and you both have mentioned Sue Schiller. I went and presented the proclamation that was signed by all three of us. And uh, there was a lovely group of people gathered to celebrate Sue's um, you know, she was at Bethany House for all those years, and she really has been a catalyst for making sure the families and kids are part of the conversation when we talk about the homeless population. And the work that she's done for this facility to be um, going up now in Bond Hill is really, it, it wouldn't have happened without Sue Schiller. So thank you to Sue for all of uh, that she's done for this community. And then lastly, um, I did a proclamation. We all signed it uh, for iSpace. Uh, they set up in, a, they were opening a new space at the old uh, Union Hall, the UAW Hall up on Reading Road. I don't know if I, I've been to it. They've spruced it up. <laughs> it looks, a, no offense to the union, but it looks a lot better now. Uh, and, and uh, but it, it's fantastic. And so iSpace, again, this is related to youth. They uh, inspire youth to go into STEM. And so a lot of kids who are alums at, uh, that one was out at Google, uh, you know, out on the East Coast, another one called in from an Ivy League university, and they're going into engineering and some technology fields, and it was really, really cool, and they were all inspired by iSpace in some of the youth camps that they had attended. So um, I delivered the proclamation on behalf of the board to celebrate their new space and also the work that they do with these young kids to um, get kids interested in STEM. So I'm happy to do that on behalf of the commission, and I too want to wish you a happy birthday. I'm not going to ask you how I think I've asked you how old you are before, and uh, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> 27. 27. All right. Same answer as last time. Uh, so, um, but happy birthday. Hope it's fun Thank tomorrow. You. Appreciate yep. it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Aludo, our administrator. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, a couple of comments, uh, and then a one by leave item uh, comment wise. Um, I did want to just bring to the board's attention is I think you're probably already aware, but I just wanted to congratulate uh, environmental services. They just recently concluded the rollout of their Mo, Gre Mo Greener uh, mower exchange program, which was really successful. So you, you've seen a lot of environmental stuff on the agenda lately. But this was a program where they um, gave incentives, $100 incentives uh, for people to recycle their diesel and gasoline mowers and in favor of a battery powered electric. I think they did 140 of them. They maxed out the program. Uh, I think a full quarter of those were distributed um, within priority environmental justice areas in the county and a minority community. So it was really well done. 
uh, really well advertised. Um, I think we're probably going to be looking at ex uh, expanding or seeing more of that in future years as well. So we'll keep the board uh, updated on that. And while I'm on that same to topic, we've got three other environmental items uh, on the agenda today from uh, environmental services. They're on the consent, so we may not highlight them, but uh, three waste reduction uh, projects um, in food waste, organics, and, and cardboard, reducing several hundred, hundred tons of waste a year um, through these uh, grant funds that are being given out. So I just wanted to highlight those as well. Um, to Vice President Reese's comment, we'll, we'll talk more at, the, uh, at a staff level about this and get you something more full, fully back on this. But as you indicated, we are uh, investing heavily on broadband um, in our ARP, in, in our budget, trying to make sure we have that baseline of technology across the county so that we can use that as a platform uh, to do other things. Um, as, as the board is aware, typically our you know, smart technology uh, projects start with a problem in mind. You know, what, what, are, what problem are we trying to so solve, whether it's uh, uh, traffic, pedestrian issues, um, water quality, et cetera. MSD uh, is doing a lot of that as well with uh, real-time controls in our sewer system uh, based upon funding and guidance from, uh, with, from, from the board. Uh, so a lot of things going on. So I'll survey and pulse staff to see some of those things that we are doing so we can get that back. And if that's then food for thought, how we can go further, um, maybe we can have that as part of a staff meeting discussion here in the, in the near future. Um, in terms of by-leave items, I do have one by-leave item on the agenda today. This is, I believe, by-leave one in your packet. Uh, this is kind of step two, if you will, on something we have um, uh, previously done. This relate this is a resolution appointing uh, the initial Region 2 representatives to the One Ohio Recovery Foundation. Um, as the board is aware for the public who may be watching, uh, there was a, a settlement, a na nationwide settlement that the state of Ohio was part of and Hamilton County had signed on to related to um, uh, a, a legal settlement with producers and distributors of, of opioids. Um, in uh, Ohio, I think it was 808 um, million dollars that is ultimately going to be coming through a settlement. Um, part of that will funnel down through the state into a foundation. Um, there are multiple foundations, uh, local foundations set up in the state that can access that, that foundation money. Um, in order to access that, we have to have our own foundation. Hamilton County is its own region known as Region 2. Uh, so the board acted a couple of months ago to uh, put together the structure of a Region 2 foundation. Uh, today, what we are doing is actually filling that out by appointing, by uh, formally designating the names to that. Uh, this is important from a timing perspective because the state wants to have the first meeting of the statewide foundation on May 16th. Um, it's it, this foundation, the regional foundation for Hamilton County has to meet to appoint someone to attend and sit on that statewide foundation. So um, absent this regional foundation meeting and voting to designate someone to go to the state, Hamilton County has no representation on that state foundation. So today is a, an important first step to designate this board so that we can help um, by scheduling the first meeting, which we will do ASAP uh, for this board to meet and for the board to uh, elect someone to attend that first state foundation. So. You have this in your packet as by leave one. Uh, the list of, of, uh, of board foundation members are included as exhibit A in that resolution. The administration recommends approval of the resolution. Thank you, Jeff. And um, each commissioner uh, did submit four different names in, in different areas as far as who we wanted on that committee. I will open it up for discussion. Vice President Reese. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I would just add, ask uh, before we vote or as we're voting, I don't know if the clerk or the administrator could read the names of the folks that will be on. It's not that many, but mm -hmm. I just think that's important. I think we have a, mm -hmm. uh, a diverse group that we put on. We've included, uh, of course, there was some standards that we had to go by, but I think we were expansive. We were inclusive and we tried to cover a lot of areas of expertise for this board. You'd like to read? Yeah. Sure, I'll read. Um, Hamilton County Commissioners will be President Stephanie Samara Dumas, Vice President Alicia Reese, Commissioner Denise Driehaus, two members from the city of Cincinnati, Council, Council Member Mika Owens, Council Member Victoria Parks. 
Hamilton County Coroner, Dr. Lakshmi Samarco. Hamilton County Health Commissioner, Commissioner Greg Kesterman. City of Cincinnati Health Commissioner, Interim Commissioner, Dr. Grant Musman. Hamilton County Mental Health and Recovery Services Board President and CEO, Patrick Tribby. Hamilton County Drug Court Judge, Judge Nicole Sanders. Hamilton County Sheriff, Charmaine McGuffey. Hamilton County Emergency Management Agency Directory, Director, Nick Crosley. Township Tr Trustee, Tracy Schwagman, Sycamore Township. Village Mayor, Mayor Ruby Kinsey, Mumphrey. Small City Mayor, Mayor Sam Keller, Cheviot. Two persons with lived experience would be R. D. Stone and Wayne Griffin. Educator, Belinda Tubbs Wallace. Mental health professional, Larian Evans. Business leader, Dr. Brian Walker. Faith leader, Reverend Floyd Walker. Hospital representative, Dr. Rick Ryan. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I was just verifying something. Thank you. Okay, uh, anything else? Yep. Okay, Commissioner Driehaus. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I want to emphasize the timing of this. We have been working on this for a while, and I want to thank my staff for helping pull some of this together. Um, this foundation money, there will be two tranches that will be available for Hamilton County. One is a direct allocation that is not what we're talking about today that will come directly to Hamilton County. Uh, the city of Cincinnati will also get a tranche, and that is separate from this money, which will be running through the foundation. Um, the importance of the timing here is that we are represented at the state level foundation um, because they're moving ahead. And so if we're there, we're there. If we're not, we're not. Uh, but we definitely need to be there. And so um, there are many counties throughout the state that are still working to appoint their people as well. Um, so we're not exactly behind the curve, but we definitely need to have this in place before that meeting starts at the state level. So I'm glad to see this in front of us. I'm glad we're um, moving forward. We have reached out to all 49 jurisdictions to make sure that they're aware that this foundation is in place, that this is the structure, ask them to weigh in. Um, some of them have sent resolutions of support in uh, related to this structure. So um, it's been a pretty broad and robust process to get us to today. And so I'm very grateful for the administration putting this in front of us. It's just been a lot of work, um, but this will allow us to have a voice at the state foundation and also receive the dollars once they start to flow down to Hamilton County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. um, I just wanted to add, I wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, Commissioner Driehaus has uh, been le the lead on this effort. It's, it hasn't been easy to put all these pieces together. So I do want to thank you uh, in your office uh, for doing that. And I think, yeah, um, as you've indicated, Hamilton County, uh, we're leading in a lot of stuff. So we got a lot to brag about, but we're leading in that area. And um, I'm not sure, I couldn't remember how much money this group we will be kind of overseeing. Do we know that yet? We do know it and I don't have it in front of me, but there are, I, I'll get it to you um, because we already know what the amount is. Is it 58? All right. I have 36 million. 36, I, so I, I overshot it. Breakdown, but I don't. Oh. <laughs> 36 is the foundation. the foundation. And yes. then what, do you have the direct allocation? In front the of direct you? allocation, I have the exact, but it's 12 million. It's 11,796,000. And, and that is and distributed. Who are, who are you? I'm sorry, I'm Lisa Webb. <laughs> yeah, so well, anybody in the audience knows that answer? We are, I just okay. peek up. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lisa. And Thank you so I'm much. sorry, Madam President. And that, and that $11 million is distributed over an 18 year period and relatively 18, 18, 18 years, yes. Yeah, okay. to, to that point, though, I think they're front loading. Some they, of they, it. they are right. They're front load some of it, but remember, uh, it, they're, they they talk a lot about the tobacco settlement when they talk in terms of this settlement, and so the tobacco settlement evidently didn't go all that well. And I not, I don't think any of us were here for that. I don't know if you, uh, but anyway, um, but they they've structured this in a way to make sure that the money goes to where the problem is, and so it. 
I mean, Cat House is in the room. Um, so these distributors were um, complicit in um, this addiction challenge and problem that we have in our community. And so the money is to go specifically to the service providers that are addressing the issues of addiction in Hamilton County. Unlike what happened with some of the settlement dollars with tobacco that went to a variety of things, not necessarily associated with what they were intended to do to begin with. Right. So Madam President, I just wanted to highlight to those who are watching, $36 million, uh, this foundation group, the names that we just named will be, uh, kind of deciding where, what's the best place to put these dollars. So I think that's just a huge thing. And that's why I wanted their names read and in, in the process, but $36 million. So that's a, that's a good amount of money to try to help with this uh, issue. So that's yeah. great. And let me also add, is, I'm sorry, if you don't mind, um, HC Arc is serving in a, an advisory capacity for this group. Uh, there are a couple members here, Pat Tribby for one, who are on HC ARC, um, but we, we purposely didn't put a lot of those experts on. We wanted to have a broad um, representation of folks that deal with this issue in the community, but HC ARC will be in the room trying to inform um, how the recommendations, the recommendations will be made by this group to the state and the state will then approve of those recommendations. Mm -hmm. You basically said what I was going to say as it relates to the diversity of inclusion in the in that group because they have the pulse of what's going on in the community. So great. Um, okay, no further discussion. I'd make a motion to approve by leave one, uh, which includes Exhibit A. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Reese. Yes. Commissioner Driehaus. Yes. Thank you so much. And, and Madam President, no further by leaves, but I did just one. Uh, uh, educational announcement, if you will. I mentioned the, uh, uh, the the mower exchange program that we have, and I did receive a text from our uh, HR director, Frank Spataro, who showed me a picture of his mower. So just educational announcement that the most environmentally friendly mower is one without an engine. Okay, so uh, oh, for, it, yeah, so uh, Frank, great job. So I'm not sure when you purchased this, but uh, it was quite some time ago. So. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> but Madam President, yes. before the um, administrator finished, I just wanted to highlight, we heard a lot of uh, concern, and I think we all share the concern on the issue of child care. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just wanted to put that on the table. I didn't know if the uh, administrator have anything, but child care, we didn't mm -hmm. uh, exclude it or forget it. Um, and I didn't know if he wanted to at least say something. Yeah, no, so, uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. So um, you know, number one, uh, child care was included as a, as a part of the recommendations in the ARP uh, recommendations that came back to the board. We heard that also through some of the comments from, from the commissioners. So as we're going back and refining that, we're gonna uh, make an effort to, to highlight that and pull it out a little bit more and, and um, specify it specifically within the scope of the recommendations that come back to you. And I think that hopefully will hit some of these policy goals uh, on strengthening the, the fabric of our child care infrastructure a little bit more, at least make it more evident how we're, how we're trying to help in this, because uh, there, there definitely was child care support within the framework of our recommendations. It just may not have been highlighted um, as well as uh, it, it could have been. So we're going to do, we're going to make sure that it's out there a little bit more evidently. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And we will move forward with our regular agenda items. And um, as we talk about these really important items on here, it's really hard to fix my mind around the fact that I hear it in my ear when I said I was 27, like the whole room just bust out laughing. And I was like, uh, it was so funny to hear that. Um, but I thank you. So uh, we're going to move forward on MSD regular agenda. And so we have before us MSD. I don't know, Karen Ball was here. And who's there you are. OK. Good afternoon. Lauren DeGracia with MSD. We have two items on the agenda today. Item number one is the certification of delinquent sewerage service charges for the property located at 35 West 5th Street or Carew Tower. Um, we are requesting certification of these delinquent charges in the amount of $251,103.46. Um, the commissioners previously certified $642,000, $59, excuse me, 
27 cents in delinquent charges from the same property on November 18th of 2021. So this current request is really just to catch us up um, and certify the additional charges that have accrued since that last certification. Um, and it is in addition to that previous amount. And I did also confirm with Cincinnati Waterworks, who does the water and sewer billing for this property. Um, as of this morning, there had still not been any payments made. Um, so certification of these unpaid charges will secure the debt and increase the likelihood that we'll be able to collect this significant delinquent amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Any questions or comments? Just one question. You said that uh, you checked with Waterworks and they still haven't paid. Now is their water off? It is not turned off. They need to run over there first before they hit these houses. <laughs> Don't get over there right away <laughs> because they are out there on some houses. This is a lot of money not to be turned off. And we've got, you know, homeowners out here struggling, trying to, you know, make it. Uh, that what they need to, all the trucks tell them to take a U-turn from these houses. Get over to the, what is this, Carew Tower? Correct. Uh, because uh, that's a lot of money. Thanks. Thank you. No questions. No questions. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve item one. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Reese. Yes. Commissioner Treehouse. Yes. Really interested in what you were saying though. Yeah. Um, why is nothing not turned off? What, what, what's the reason for that? Um, well, as you stated earlier, the, there was a moratorium on shutoffs uh, mm -hmm. for a period of time. Right, um, 251000 Right. Um, I mean, I can say that Waterworks has, and our other municipalities that uh, perform billing and collection services, have multiple tools in their toolboxes that they do use, sure. whether it be sh shutting off, which is a, you know, obviously not the preferred approach to use. We hope for it to be a last resort. Um, certification okay. is another tool. Bringing sorts of legal actions is a tool. Sure. Um, you know, calling people repeatedly is a tool they use that's actually quite effective. So, um, you know, I'm not prepared to give you a detailed response in, in, in how that decision is made and what methods to use or combination of methods to use for each property. Each property is uh, different. Obviously, this is a large building with tenants that would be, um, you know, punished for actions that, that may be more attributable to the owner. Um, certainly different than a, a single family household. But So passing this indicates our agreement with trying to get that money, but also maybe you can pass on the, that the discussion did come up. Certainly. Yeah. yeah so, uh, I, I, mm -hmm. maybe we could get something in writing. I, I mean, I, I agree. You know, we. Are, I'm not for really shutting anybody off. I think the moratorium should go a little longer, but I mean, we got to be. You know, we got to have one set of rules. I mean, we can't have one set of rules if you're, you know, big business, and another set of rules with crushing little people. You know, if if if, the, if you go in a house and you can't use all these tools, and you you know. I mean, the trucks are out. I've seen them. And these people are getting cut off. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're running, trying to get uh, programs and get money to them. But it just gives a, the wrong message. I'm not saying it's on you, but I'd like to get us, something, the board, something in writing. What were all the tools and when does the tool stop? Mm -hmm. uh, because it just doesn't seem fair. And, we, and our, our goal is to push one set of rules, not one if you're over here, and two if you're over here. Uh, and our taxpayers will be very uh, hurt and upset to know. A senior citizen want to know, why you come tearing my stuff off? And these people get to run up. If they, if they collected this money, we could probably have a moratorium for about two more months on everyday homeowners. So it's not putting it on you, but if you could get us, sit it back, get us something in writing, what are all the steps? When did they get behind? Uh, how many calls did you make, and and when is the when is the when is enough enough, uh, so that we have a better uh, understanding and we can uh, articulate this to uh, homeowners that are out here right now just trying to trying to survive. Sure, I think we appreciate those comments, and I think would welcome those discussions. So they have they may have something they could give us to tell us what has give us an update on where we are on it. Commissioner yeah, I just wanted to weigh in. I'm getting a lot of calls in my office about this, uh, and I know it's a waterworks issue, not necessarily an MSD issue. 
but um, we're, we're struggling. We're trying to advise folks as to what to do when they're facing these water shutoffs. So maybe Kathy Bailey would come in from Cincinnati Waterworks and give us a better understanding of what that looks like. And I don't know about you, you your offices, but I've gotten multiple calls on this and it's really hard. To, it, uh, Chris Harding just re-entered the room. I mean, he's been taking the calls, but it's, it's hard to understand the process and know how to advise. Uh, folks when they call in. So I think that would be a really helpful, maybe a uh, topic for a staff meeting or something so that we can get better educated on the process for waterworks. All right, we Thank can you. do that for sure. Item number two. Item number two is a requested exception to the MSD rules and regulations, article two, section 206, regarding the residential property located at 1325 Edwards Road. Uh, section 206 generally prohibits building a structure over an MSD sewer, uh, with some exceptions, and the owners at 1325 Edwards are seeking to build a garage over an existing 48-inch public sewer, which traverses their property. Uh, MSD has evaluated the request and had the owners sign an agreement with the county to provide certain restrictions regarding the way the structure is constructed and will be maintained uh, so that it doesn't adversely affect the underlying sewer. The agreement also provides protections, namely indemnification to the county uh, for, the, for any future damage that may occur. We, of course, don't anticipate that um, in exchange for granting this exception. And adoption of this legislation will actually also serve to um, authorize the administrator to execute that agreement, and MSD would then record it on the property. Did this come before us uh, about a month and a half ago? We had a similar one for Xavier, if oh, you recall. Okay. They were... Um, building an, uh, an addition to a building that was also over, much more expansive than this, sure. than this structure, but um, yes, very similar. Yeah, thank you. Vice President Reyes, no questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, so again, I've gotten a call in my office about a similar situation where some, there was a structure on a piece of property, that structure was evidently built over a pipe, uh, MSD pipe, uh, was torn down, the constituent, um, bought the property, assuming she could build on that property since their building had already stood there, come to find out she couldn't because there was a sewer pipe underneath it. And she, she again, is really struggling with this process. So is, is it that when they go to MSD, MSD says a yes or a no for their ability to build over a sewer pipe, and then it comes in front of the board for final approval? Is that how the process works? Um, so I can't speak to that specific instance, but I, generally the process is a request to the board for that exception. However, I will say they come to us in our development services uh, division um, with people wanting or seeking a permit to build something. Um, and when we see that it's over the sewer, that's when you know that sort of evaluation starts and it varies by property, varies by structure and whether or not, well, first of all, what we would require to make sure that the sewer is safe throughout construction and then post-construction with that structure being maintained there. Um, and then drafting an agreement, like I've referenced with this one and making sure that we can agree upon terms um, and then bringing it to the board with our recommendation. How often do you get these kind of requests? I don't know, I can provide that information. And how I can many say- are denied And how many are approved? Just, I'm just curious to know what the volume is of these kinds of requests. I, I think one or two come before the board for to be legislated per year. Mm -hmm. How many people come in with a build over request? Mm -hmm. I can't say. I could find that information you, for yeah. you and provide that. Appreciate um, it. I think that where they may die in that process is that MSD, you know, depending again on the structure and the underlying sewer, maybe there are too many requirements for them to be able to build on top of it and it becomes cost prohibitive. prohibitive. So I think that that's where it dies somewhere on the line. I'm sure we do get more requests than actually make it up to the board. Great, thank you. Okay, no further discussion. I'd like to make a motion to approve item number two. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Reese. Yes. Commissioner Driehaus. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for coming. You have before you consent agenda items. Trying to say something. So we have consent agenda items, uh, item three through 13. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I did want to mention, um, just real happy to see about human resources and that we changed some of the policy as it relates to reemployment of retirees and make sure we were 
doing everything we needed to do as we try to fill some of those vacancies. But the main ones I wanted to speak about were the JFS uh, ones that resolution that we need to pass. Um, there are two aftercare services that are being provided, um, individual, individual living aftercare services. And then we have two group home services and uh, foster care services for our young people and consulting services. Uh, those are the ones that I wanted to speak about. Um, there's one thing on the front. Um, and then there is a pretty large budget adjustment item four, um, consolidated space for the Office of Reentry, engineers road improvements in Columbia Township and remaining appropriations for the bank's phase 3C $19 million um, appropriation. I'll open it up for uh, Vice President, if you had any comments on any of them. Uh, yes, uh, uh, just wanted to go back on item number four. Um, I think this is, uh, I think possibly the final, but one of the, uh, one of the uh, funding that's within the budget, but it's uh, on the construction side of the uh, Black Music Walk of Fame. And um, I think that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that will also help with the uh, interactive components uh, that we're all excited about. Uh, so that actually puts the funding in the, uh, I guess, in the bank so they could start doing that. And I think the final uh, RFP that we approved, uh, the folks are getting busy on the interactive component. So uh, looking forward to that. I think that's good. The other one that I wanted to bring um, attention to is item number uh, 12. This is a uh, consultant, if I'm not mistaken, administrator, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you explained it to me. It's a consultant that keeps up with what's going on with Medicaid. And I just wanted to highlight, I know uh, when I arrived, there was a moratorium on some of the ideas or uh, policies from the state as it related to Medicaid. So uh, folks were not thrown off of Medicaid. My understanding that now uh, they're moving forward. So just might wanna get, uh, I think it would be a good idea if we could get some kind of update. I know it was an update when it was proposed at the state level, but I just think, um, it would be helpful, and I know it'd be helpful for me if we could get where are we now with the state as it relates to Medicaid, because I understand it's going to impact thousands and thousands of citizens in Hamilton County, and they're going to almost be, you know, feel like they've been blindsided. So I know that this person's job is to keep up with what's going on there, uh, but I wanted to highlight that point. I think Director Patton. Madam President, yeah, I was going to ask if uh, Director Patton might uh, speak to this briefly. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we are working with the state on Medicaid unwinding. So as uh, the state decides in the public health emergency, uh, the regulations and rules for eligibility for Medicaid are going to go back to pre-pandemic uh, levels, and that will impact eligibility for families in Hamilton County as it relates to their Medicaid eligibility. So uh, it will involve a lot of work of our frontline staff to make sure that they have a list of those folks who are potentially uh, be affected by this and doing some outreach and communication with the help of the state to make sure that we are prepared, working with our JFSPC partners to make sure we get the word out about the timing uh, when this might go into effect. Uh, the, the current uh, date is looks like it's gonna be July 1st, but that's still not uh, definitive just yet. Uh, but we're working with staff to make sure that we're prepared uh, to take on uh, the reapplication of those eligibility factors. Uh, we do anticipate that that might generate uh, some complaints and some just uh, some issues related to that because folks will be going back to uh, pre-pandemic level eligibility and may not be eligible. The same thing will be true for uh, SNAP benefits as well. So we're working really closely with the state to make sure we're prepared uh, and to, can handle the volume of the cases that uh, we will need to determine redetermine eligibility on uh, during that time. I believe the number uh, uh, that we last seen was around 36,000, uh, maybe a little bit higher than that, that would potentially be impacted uh, by these changes. So we get reports from the state, have a meeting actually uh, scheduled tomorrow uh, with the state Metro directors to talk specifically about uh, how we are planning to, to handle uh, what they're calling Medicaid unwinding. Okay. Uh Thank you for that. No problem. Um, 
I just was wondering if we could get, so we're not caught off guard because we'll, just as you're getting calls, we'll get calls. If maybe, I don't know, um, I don't know if it's a staff meeting. I don't know if it's something presented to us uh, through the administrator, but I think this is a, we got to be prepared ourselves. Uh, uh, JFS plus the board. So we all kind of on the same page. Uh, there's some plan in place. Uh, if there's other places that they can get help, we need to come with it. They got their theme called Medicaid Unwind. We want to come up with something that we got our theme. Here's where you go. Um, the other thing I, I was told, I could be wrong because you're on the calls and I'm no longer at the state house, but some of my former colleagues were telling me that it's more than unwind, it's unraveling. I heard that there were people who not pre-pandemic, but they were the people before the pandemic was about to get cut, not just the people that already had it. So I don't know if that's true, but they said they were going to cut before the pandemic, the people who were already on it. So that was one cut. That's two cuts right there. Then we had the pandemic and they said, well, hold up. So I just want to make sure that um, we don't want anybody to get you know, cut that's eligible. But I understood that the numbers were going to already be cut from the numbers we already had pre-pandemic. And then if you come back here, it's kind of like you're cutting two, two sets of people. So I just, uh, Mr. Administrator, I like for us to get a joint plan how Hamilton County is going to deal with this. Uh, I think it's important because we trying to make a final decision about our ARPA. That's got to be part of it because if these people are 36,000 or 40,000 more people will not have help, we need to know that before we pass our ARPA plan because you know we're thinking these folks are helped over here and we're trying to add some new people to be helped, but that might not be the right direction if 36,000 that we don't even know or more are going to be hit because we'll have nothing available for them. So, you know what I'm saying? So we just want to not have a plan in silos. ARPA over here, JFS over here, state over here. We need to have, what's the total picture look like? And then we can make a, I think to me, a better intelligent decision. And part of our ARPA plan has to be, how do we deal with the communication, the outreach, the help, to stabilize these people who probably don't know that they're getting ready to be cut. Because if you don't watch, you know, they don't write about state moves down here. Uh, they don't write about it at all. So they have no idea they're getting cut until they got cut. And so uh, I just think we need a communications plan. We need a theme. We need a hotline number. We need our 513 relief. We need our ARPA with a whole plan that incorporates this, what you're, uh, knowledgeable about because I think that's gonna that's gonna be a devastating effect to to the citizens of Hamilton County. Yeah, Madam President, we uh, Madam President, Madam Vice President, we can uh, certainly pull that information together, and as we come back forward with the ARPA recommendations, provide some uh, basic information on this, so you, we all understand the the gravity and the scope of of the issue, and where there might be um, uh, there might be relationships between where people can get help through the through our ARPA plan, ARPA funding, et cetera. Um, and then the board can uh, consider that from a policy perspective as to whether there's any additional changes you want to see in, in the ARPA allocation. That Happy to do good. that. And Thank as well, um, uh, Director Patton, I'm sure, and his team can pull together uh, some basic resources for each office so that as you get calls on this, uh, that you can respond effectively to your constituents who are reaching out to you. That'd be great. Certainly Thank you. Do that. That's, Thank you. that's great. Great discussion. Yeah, we, we have to be in front of it. Um, did you have anything? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we will, with no further discussion, um, I'd like to make a motion to approve items three through 13. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Reeves. Yes. Commissioner Dreehouse. Yes. Thank you so much. No further business to come before the board. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Reeves. Yes. Commissioner Dreehouse. Yes. Thank you.